Uh, so good morning. My name is Lizzie Glitherow West. I'm the chief executive of the Heritage Alliance, and I'm a white brunette woman in my early 40s talking to you from my Edwardian front room today. I may at some point during this presentation be, dis uh, be disturbed by a 17 year old cat. Uh, welcome to our first session of Heritage Day this year. And as Ingrid noted in our 20th anniversary year, a milestone really worth celebrating. Some of you are new to the Heritage Alliance and to Heritage Day, welcome to you. And some of you have been with us from the outset 20 years ago, welcome and also thank you to you. I've spent a few happy hours recently excavating the Heritage Alliance archives. And with the help of a pair of enthusiastic interns and some colleagues who can recall the dawn of Alliance time, I've been uncovering some wonderful relics and documents from the beginning of our journey. This morning, I thought I'd take us backwards to look at where things began, as well as taking a few moments to reflect on where we are and where we are going. Here we are, back in 2001 at Castle Ashby in Northamptonshire. We certainly aren't joining from our computer screens. We may not even yet have personal mobile phones. There's a Labour government in power, Tony Blair, no less. Our chair, Pam Alexander, is present in her role as English Heritage. I've just graduated and I'm probably herding secondary school kids. The youngest members of the Alliance team are currently at primary school. Here gather several sector players, including the Joint Committee of National Immunity Societies to collaborate and design. And the Alliance as we know it today is conceived as Heritage Link. Ministers had noted that the heritage sector was seemingly fragmented. And the Heritage Link sought to break down the artificial division and interest between different heritage sites and environments. The meeting concluded that a heritage network would add value by enabling the sector to speak to governments with a strong collective voice. The aim was to connect and build on the experience of non-government organisations in a collaborative way, taking advantage of, at that point, a more consultative government. Heritage Link also aimed to share resources, intelligence, and research capabilities, building capacity within the sector and presenting clear messages to a wider public. The idea was brought to life by a group known as the Four Wise Men, Tony Burton, Marcus Binney, Philip Venning and John Sell. I'm delighted that at least two of this group are joining us from Heritage Day this year. I spoke to Philip Venning just before Christmas and he noted I well remember the meeting at Castle Ashby that gave rise to the founding of Heritage Link 20 years ago, and at which I spoke in its favour. We decided to base it on the successful Wildlife and Countryside Link, which also still exists, and chose to call it Heritage Link after some debate. Of some 150 heritage organisations came together the following year for the first AGM, the official launch of Heritage Link. This was held at Wilton's Music Hall in the East End of London in December 2022. No, December 2002. Um, members elected Tony Burton, Jennifer Freeman, Honor Gay, George Lambrick, John Sell, Philip Venning, and Richard Wilkin as the first trustees. Members noted to undertake a review of the needs and potential of the voluntary sector within heritage and to come up with a plan of action for resolving the issues that are of common concern to all members. Heritage Link planned to set up working groups on funding, land use and planning system, and education and inclusion. English Heritage, at now Historic England, made 138,000 available to Heritage Link to support its work over the next three years, a support that under their new guise as Historic England has continued and we're very grateful for. Seedcorn was already also being provided by the National Trust. In addition, the Society of Antiquaries provided office and meeting accommodation, and the Council for British Archaeology hosted Heritage Link's web pages. Thank you to all those organisations still active and valued parts of Alliance membership today. The new organisation's mission statement stated, Heritage Link was set up to bring people together who care about our heritage, to formulate policy, influence opinion, and achieve change on issues of common concern. Heritage Link was also to act as a hub through which information is shared between members. I have found some wonderful quotes from this official launch. 
most of them actually captured in a Salon article, which is the newsletter of the Society of Antiquaries back in 2002. So Neil Cussons, the, the chair of English Heritage at the time, welcoming the new Heritage Link said, a new national charity is set up to provide the rallying point for championing the aims and values of the historic environment sector. And he said, in years to come, we could look back on this day as one of the most significant in the history of the heritage. As also reported in that article, Charles Nun Nunley, the chair of the National Trust at that point, noted that Heritage Link represents an unprecedented opportunity for the sector to work together to create one Lennox Lewis out of a gymnasium full of flyweights. I'm not sure that any of the organisations here today would be described now as flyweights. And meanwhile, Minister of, Art, uh, of the Arts at the time, Baroness Blackstone, wrote a message of support for the day. She talked about the policy challenges ahead. Little did she know where, where we now find ourselves. But she reflected on the power of a collective voice and handed the baton to all of us to make it work. We can take this same message away today. It is still as relevant as ever and as encouraging. With Link's initial campaign, issues focused on planning, funding and social inclusion. The heart of the issues we care about have remained the same but expanded. Some perennial issues such as VAT on repair and maintenance, I sigh to see you looking at the archives come up as a perennial issue throughout every year and through the years, a stubborn issue to fix. But it's really encouraging, I think, to see that our journey as a sector in caring about access and inclusion, still a major focus for us today, really began from that outset and that initial meeting. While 2010 brought a name change to the Heritage Alliance, the core vision has remained the same. And we've grown from link to alliance and from 50 to almost 200 organisations over that time. Some themes and shifts over this time, uh, which are worth reflecting on. Here's four uh, to start us off. Firstly, there's been a shift from us being an umbrella of umbrellas, a gathering of sector support and coordinating bodies to an alliance for all, with members ranging from universities to individual sites, from railways to theatres, geographically spread throughout England, the UK, and many with international remits. Many of these original organisations remain very much at the heart of our advocacy work. But our membership has broadened and deepened, and there is a place and a role for everyone. In 2006, three or so years in, members called for more ambition, and this was delivered. Link expanded its work to reflect wider interests of the group, for example, green development. It developed its communication and media outlets, increasing its online presence and therefore the number of people it reached. Greater ambition meant more members, and as membership grew, so did influence. The Alliance developed its role as a catalyst for collaborative working by supporting sectoral and cross-sectoral forums, placing this communal element as central to its values. And we've continued to build on this foundation. Though we've grown, broadened and deepened, we have still further to go into areas ranging from intangible cultural heritage and communities and memories to sector support bodies who want to work with our sector. If you're here today and not yet a member, you are very welcome please do join us. Secondly, there has been a shift over time from a focus on just advocacy and communicating and connecting, all very critical in their own way, to add in the delivery of major sector support programmes initiated by Kate Pugh with the brilliant Giving to Heritage programme, a model for everything that has come afterwards. Giving to Heritage, running from 2014 to 17 and funded by the National Heritage Lottery Fund, was a training programme for fundraisers in partnership with the Institute of Fundraising. Concilium Research and Consultancy's independent evaluation found that 3.15 million was already raised by attendees by the time the programme had closed that was directly attributable to participation and will have increased since. We have to thank the National Lottery Heritage Fund for their significant investment in sector support in this first programme and in more recent years and their trust in the Alliance to deliver. Alongside other noteworthy funders also, who've really supported us over many years, such as the Historic Houses Foundation for their ongoing support for Heritage Update, which has existed from the outset, and the invaluable Heritage Funding Directory. 
Over the past decade, the Alliance has moved with the times. It's seen the importance of digital progress and identified skills gaps in the heritage sector. Incorporating this into our capacity building focus to offer support and training, ranging from digital skills to fundraising, business planning, equality, diversity and inclusion, well-being, leadership and more. And we really hope to continue this important function into the future. Thirdly, Katie has spoken of the immense voluntary effort that went into the Alliance from the outset. Scaffolding and supporting the tiny team, which only began with two, uh, to deliver so much. Today, by this incredible effort from our trustees, advocacy group chairs, trainers and long-serving volunteers. Last year, our accounts noted that almost 6,000 hours of voluntary effort supported our team. But the staff team in the Alliance has also really grown in the last five years to tackle the breadth and depth of the challenges we face as a sector and the services needed by us to thrive. Here's our team and trustees just through 2022, all brilliant and passionate, but I'm aware how many faces would need to be on this slide if we look back through 20 years, perhaps a project for one day. And it's a delight that so many have continued their journey in the heritage sector and several are here with us today. Emma now at Historic Houses alongside Ben, our last deputy chair, Joe over at the Vixoc, Matt and Kate, at UNESCO, Francesca working in Italy but joining us today. Many others have served as trustee. Mike Hayworth has been both. It's our people that make the Alliance what it is, working with our valued membership, supporters and funders, and we're enormously grateful to them all, past, present and still to come. It's also been a pleasure looking back over the formidable leadership of the Alliance over these 20 years. Chris, the initial coordinator, was followed by just two CEOs, including 13 significant years of KPU's dedicated and formidable leadership. We've had five cha chairs since 2002, two of whom I'm delighted are with us for Heritage Day this year, not to leave out Ingrid Samuel, our deputy chair, who was a dedicated acting chair following the sad passing of Peter Ainsworth, who many of us still miss and whose generous spirit has left a clear and lasting legacy with our team or rapidly changing, just the one DCMS, which has surprised us sometimes um, and survived various machinery of government changes, but an inordinate amount of heritage ministers we have collectively got to know, worked with, advocated to, said farewell to, some of whom we welcome, said goodbye to and welcomed again, the duplicates here are no accident. I think I'm on my 10th since joining the Alliance, Lord Parkinson, the latest, who will be addressing us tomorrow. And finally, as a theme over this time, with the name change from Link to Alliance, it's been noted by many people we've spoken to that there was an intentional shift from perhaps a more passive idea of linking or connection to an active advocacy and collaborative effort with the choice of Alliance. Philip Venning reflected back on the Castle Ashby meeting, noting that we were worried the, Alliance, the Heritage Alliance might sound like some crazy right-wing body. However, we were wrong. The change of name makes more sense. John Sell described the progress of the Alliance as successfully fulfilling its first aim of creating a single united voice for communicating with government to becoming a more finely tuned political antennae. 10 years ago, this growing role was already evident and valued by politicians. Looking back over the last 20 year, years, our interns spoke to various previous players within the Alliance's journey and a few particularly memorable projects were mentioned and identified. Uh, do you remember some of these and do drop into the chat any key memorable moments for you, um, particularly those who've worked with us within the Alliance or worked on these projects. We'd love to hear from you and hear about them. Here's a canter through a few that have been identified. 2005 to 8, work on the Heritage Protection White Paper and Draft Bill. Some of us here today also worked on this uh, with the sector from within DCMS before skipping over the fence. Uh, 2012 saw the Cultural Olympiad campaign. The Alliance appointed a dedicated part-time project coordinator to take the Access All Areas project forward with funding from the Olympic Organising Committee and English Heritage. Discovering Places, led by Ian Lush, showed the potential for heritage to combine with other bodies in the national and international celebration. This included mapping out stories of Olympic nations, engaging young people via historic and natural environment, and telling stories of the impact of regeneration. 
At this time, I also understand that the Alliance led the campaign to protect the share of heritage funding that came from the National Lottery, which had planned to divert money towards the Olympics. The 20% uh, commitment was, was preserved towards heritage. And the Alliance also ran Engaging Places, a series of free workshops across the country that relayed the latest information on the national curriculum and offered ways in which heritage sites could better engage with schools. The aim of this project was to increase engagement across the UK and different communities. Heritage 2020 was a major collaborative initiative to sustain and promote the historic environment of England, encourage access and broaden knowledge for a variety of audiences. It ran from 2015 to 2020 and involved over 40 organisations, many of whom are still here today from across the historic environment sector in England. Its legacy is seen in the new model historic environment forum. 2016 to 2019 saw some necessary Brexit advocacy work. When the Brexit decision was communicated, we work hard to assess impacts and advocate in the areas of regulations, funding and movement of people and materials. Our insight work generated lots of policy papers, including advocacy around shortage occupations. We ran a travel grant scheme with support from the British Council in 2019. There were many successful trips and reports as a result of that funding. And sponsored by the Oxford University Humanities Division, Heritage Dialogue series of webinars were held and kept many of us sane during 2020 to 21, providing a forum for debate, discussion and sharing on important issues to the sector during a pandemic when we were all working from our front rooms. The Alliance also ran a series of, of support during this time, including a rebuilding heritage training programme and a live hub collating guidance and support in a rapidly changing political landscape. Alongside our regular manifestos and policy documents, the Alliance has also published a range of major publications over the years, of which this is a small selection, looking at the ways in which heritage is and continues to be a part of the solution to other public policy problems. A great strength of these publications is that they're full of strong case studies of great practice from the full breadth of our membership, allowing us to present recommendations for change. So that's a real canter through our past, but where are we now? It's been quite a year, three heritage ministers, three prime ministers, two monarchs, a government in flux, international conflicts, a fuel and cost of living crisis, climate change coming to the fore, and we're emerging from the challenges of the pandemic, but there is still much to tackle. We need to keep working together more than ever to, to keep that vision that the original heritage link set up and to build resilience and turning adversity into opportunities to grow and to do new things. We've been continually inspired by our creative and passionate and resilient membership at the Alliance. Six major themes remain foremost in our minds at the present time. Recovery and resilience, including skills for the future, a focus for today. Cost of living, levelling up. Environment and climate change. Diversity, access and inclusion and finding and supporting our new place in the world after Brexit and the pandemic. Some themes are longer standing, but cost of living has emerged as a newer challenge this year due to fuel prices, costs of materials and labour alongside inflation, a real layering of multiple issues coming out of the last few years. Cost of living has been cited also in the Association of Leading Visitor Attractions regular public sentiment survey as a new and significant barrier for people engaging in domestic tourism and heritage. We're currently working with Historic England to run an evidence desk to collate evidence of impact. Thank you for the evidence you have all provided. It has and is making a difference to government's thinking. It's a considerable collective achievement that government has recognised heritage as one of the sectors for support due to high energy use. And from the evidence we've collected from our members and others across the sector, we know that the impacts of the cost of living crisis will be felt for at least the next 12 months and are impacting organisations in five key areas, bills and energy prices, staff retention and wages, consumer confidence, cutting costs and ongoing COVID-19 recovery. Additional support will be vital to the continuation of the heritage sector in the UK. There are still many detailed questions which we would like government to answer around eligibility and the nature of support, and we continue to work on them in these areas. Skills, a theme for today, and also an important and connected overarching theme for this year, as is the future of volunteering. 
The sector's own work for the future around its sector resilience plan is underway and Historic England has created a welcome skills forum to coordinate discussion and thinking around heritage skills in the future. Pay and conditions, skills and workforce pipeline, reduction in student numbers and the impact of Brexit are all factors. And as Kate Geary inspiringly said at this year's heritage debate, heritage is about people and we need more diverse voices telling our stories about the past. The skills that our disciplines draw on are similarly diverse and require a diversity of routes to develop and sustain them. Sustainable careers require sustainable business models rooted in the value that we bring to society. Without a skilled and valued workforce, we cannot maximise the benefits heritage brings to society. And we need to understand the challenges that we may face in the future and the skills that we are going to need to address them. There is much to reflect on and continue advocating for. But as we've noted many times before, this is a moment also for optimism and for us to think collectively about the ways to learn from each other, share best practice and consider how best to make the case for the transformative role of heritage for society more broadly. In 2023, with you, we will be reactively focused on planning and levelling up matters, the environment and cost of living issues, as well as tackling anything important and yet to emerge. We will seek to proactively influence manifestos and continue to look at skills issues and keep focused on our work on equality, diversity and inclusion. We'll continue to offer further bespoke member support, such as the established advocacy groups, briefings and consultation opportunities and, and continuing to connect and, and support our community of members. So how about further into the future? For the Alliance, we're delighted to be here 20 years on, and you've told us loud and clear that there's a continued and increasing need for our work. The connections we offer to the sector and the support we lever into your organisations, we will keep listening to your needs and working to ensure that we're able to collectively operate as more than the sum of our parts. And what about the sector as a whole? More fundamentally, what will we be tackling 20 years from now when the Alliance is celebrating 40 years? I've gone for some final moments of inspiration to the 20 blogs published as part of our 20th anniversary heritage debate held in the autumn. In a post entitled Fighting Fit for the Future, the Historic Environment Forum team reflected that whilst we can't know for certain what awaits us in the future, we can at least think meaningfully about what we'd like to see there and take tangible steps towards seeing these ideals realised. What wisdom is out there for us to take as inspiration into our two Heritage Day sessions this year? What do some of our leading professionals dream of for our sector into the future? Here are a few of my favourites. Firstly, on the environment and change. There's a vision of heritage that's both preserved, but also able to change and adapt into the future. Where we cannot save everything as climate change occurs and landscapes change, we need to be creative in our recording, our storytelling, our accessibility. Our living collections and resources are also part of our heritage and part of this story. Chelsea Physic Garden argues that living collections are just as important as any other museum collection. Secondly, the people and the need for a generosity of spirit. Heritage without people is nothing, Hannah Cunliffe of National Historic Ships writes. So continued engagement, passion and enthusiasm for the sector, combined with an understanding of its value will surely still be what matters most and all else will flow from this. Instead of focusing on what matters for, most for heritage, Sarah Croft of Icon says, the question we should really be asking is what matters most to society and how can heritage help to achieve the change that our society needs? And she identifies collaboration and sharing as critical to this. Heritage has a significant role in building trust and solidarity into the future, say UNESCO UK, who see a future where what will matter most could be the heritage that's co-created by migrants and hosts, by young and elderly citizens and by the people of different countries. All these people share so much more with each other than what divides them. Heritage is one way of expressing our commonalities to build stronger and more peaceful societies. So diversity will make us stronger. The, her the heritage and history we tell will become richer and engage us in fascinating forms, taking full advantage of the technologies we develop, say Lillet Ar Architects. Understanding our diverseness and uniqueness will, will really enrich society. And the Linen Hall Belfast challenges, rather than asking how or why we can attract diverse groups to our organisations, we should question what barriers are in place to prevent them. We will need to learn to adapt and to create, to upskill 
and to listen. And there are some particular visions for this, heritage as healing and providing real solutions for health. And finally, a real thought for the future from Katie Childs of Chawton House. We had to matter in people's lives now and in the future. So what, so we would be missed if we were gone. So what will matter most to heritage in 20 years time? That we listen to our youngest staff 20 years before. That's today, we can and need to do this today. And indeed we will hear from a panel of young trustees as part of our leadership session tomorrow at Charter House. I'd like to finish then where we started with a thank you and a reminder that our 20 year journey is just really the beginning. Right from the beginning, we've been your Alliance and we are here because of you and for you. I hope the Alliance will still be going strong 200 years from now, but this will only happen if we keep our members in sight. We work together, we focus on the good that Heritage can achieve and keep our eye on the horizon. I hope Heritage Day this year will help us all to do that.